Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Frazier. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at First Baptist. Some of you know me, some of you may not. If you're a guest, we're glad that you stuck around for this. And uh, tonight is called Cathobaptology. I've said this the last several weeks. That is a made-up word. The reason I know that is because I made it up. <laughs> and it's just a, a word to describe what we're trying to do. And I want to talk a few minutes about what we're here to do and what we're not here to do tonight to put you at ease if you have any anxiety about that or if you... Um, if you have any concerns about that. The idea for the, we, we, I, this is the second version of something like this we did about four years ago. And the, the idea initially came from this. I, I lead our new membership classes here at FBCG. And over the last four or five, maybe six years or so, every membership class, I always ask people that are newer to our church or joining our church what their faith tradition, what their background is. And we have a kind of a melting pot of people from across Protestant denominations. And I was noticing that a quarter to a third of every new member's class was former Catholic. Now, that's a broad uh, category. Some of them would say they, went to, they were baptized as an infant, they were, had their first communion and were confirmed and hadn't been to church since. Some went to parochial school and were at mass every week until they came here and everything in between. Um, and so I, I found and our, our staff found people were asking questions about what's different here, what is the difference, what do you believe that we, that I grew up not believing, or is there a difference, and how can I articulate that? That's where the genesis for the idea of this, this discussion came from, this, this presentation, and that's why we decided to do it. Um, I, I, one man, uh, I recall, saying to me, I can tell this is different than the church I grew up in, duh. <laughs> and he said, but I don't know how to articulate the difference, can you help me? So that's kind of what we're here to do. Now, we, we will not and we could not possibly cover all of the nuances and the distinctions and the differences and the disagreements and the similarities. It would be impossible. We would need a couple years worth, well, maybe centuries. It's been going on that long uh, uh, of discussion. So that, that's not what we're here to do. Um, if you have particular questions that are not addressed in the prepared remarks, which should last anywhere from 70 to 90 minutes, uh, if that makes you nervous, you can slide out. I won't care. Um, you can ask that at the end. I'll stick around afterwards for a little bit of Q&A, and if you'd like to ask those questions, I'll try and address them, or we might table them for a, a future date. Um, so, a couple of things that we're, we're not here to do. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. We are not here to pass judgment on any group of people. Um, I cannot, that, that, I want to make that very clear. This is not an event to tell you why one group is right and one group is wrong. You will hear some very clear statements about what, what we at FBCG and inside of what we call evangelical Protestantism believe are important differences. But it's not, I hope you, don't, hope you understand we're not here to bash any group or, or pass judgment on any group. We're also not here to tell anybody what they have to believe. I don't know all of you, I know many of you, but if you're here coming with a different uh, set of beliefs or, or background, that's completely fine. We respect that. Nobody's trying to coerce anybody or convert anybody or convince anybody. Um, I also am not here to add to the tension that already exists between not just Protestants and Catholics, but all kinds of denominational and religious differences. So we're not trying to do that either. Um, and fourth, which is not on the uh, deal here, is we're here to, uh, not here to cover every nuance or detail. I already mentioned that. So uh, before we talk about what we are here to do, I want to say that I cannot speak from within Roman Catholicism because I'm not a Roman Catholic. Uh, but I can, and am trying to, uh, respond to what official Catholic doctrine or teaching is coming out of Rome and the, the papacy and the magisterium. So, I'm not addressing your particular experience if you grew up in a Catholic church or family, uh, because I couldn't possibly know that, and that's not what we're doing. So I can only speak, and that would be true, by the way, for any of us talking about anybody, in any particular religion or denomination or faith tradition. We all have our own experiences and our own particular beliefs. Tonight, I'm responding from a a Protestant Baptist minister's perspective and what we believe the scripture teaches to what the official doctrines coming out of the catechisms and the, and the councils and the magisterium of Rome. Not necessarily anybody's individual experience. Does that make sense? I can't see many of you because the lights are so bright. So anyway, first row, please nod at me if you're with me. Okay, so what were we here to do? First, we want to clarify and define where we agree. And it may surprise you to hear this, but there is a tremendous amount that we agree on and we share, and we should celebrate that, we should identify that, and we want to do that tonight. Second, we want to clarify and define where we disagree. Where are the points of divergence? And third, rather obviously I think, we want to clarify and define why those differences matter. Because not every difference does. But which differences matter and why? 
So that's what I, I hope to accomplish or begin to accomplish here this evening. Um, some of you will be familiar with a phrase that is often attributed to um, uh, St. Augustine, uh, although he didn't actually write this as far as anybody can, can tell. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Uh, it's often a quoted, it's often attributed to Augustine. John Wesley quoted it frequently. It was made popular by a man named Richard Baxter, who was a Puritan pastor and theologian. Uh, however, I did a little digging, historical digging on this. I uh, called a couple, even a professor that I know, uh, and, and, and tried to figure out where, who said this first. Um, most scholars uh, 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 attribute it to a man named Rupertus Melindus, Melindina, excuse me. He was a German Lutheran theologian. About 1626 was the height of his uh, theological career. However, a man named uh, Marco di Domini, a ca the Catholic Archbishop of Spalato, is the earliest documented instance of this saying in 1622. Didomini was a very troubled uh, character. He spoke out against the papacy and uh, had to flee uh, Italy for fear of the Inquisition, ended up in England, but he had some character flaws, namely arrogance and pride, that got him kicked out of England. And he came back to uh, Europe and he, re he recanted his position against the papacy, embraced the, the Pope in Rome, was welcomed back in, and the Pope gave him a stipend uh, to live on. When that Pope died, his, his sort of his pension was gone, and he re, re, uh, he re earthed, re brought up his, his uh, uh, criticism of the papacy, and he got <laughs> condemned as a heretic by the Inquisition many years later and died under house arrest. So, anyway, uh, that has nothing to do with anything, but I thought it was interesting. So, this is a very good, uh, this is a great statement for all of us when we talk about issues that may be t tense. In essentials, unity. In what really matters about fa our faith and, and our life, we should be united. And what doesn't matter, non-essentials, we should be clear-headed about it, but have some liberty, have some freedom. There's room for disagreement or difference, I should say. And in all things, charity, treat each other with respect and kindness, not with condescension or de demonizing those. You know, our culture, by the way, in, uh, on this note, if you want to read a good book on this issue, D.A. Carson's book, um, The Intolerance of Tolerance. Uh, it's a great book and a great read. He says, our culture has bought into two terrible lies, not just religiously, but even in politically, in debate. And the two lies are this, if I disagree with you, I must demonize you and oppose you at every turn. You see that in polit politics all the time, don't you? Can't even listen to each other anymore. And the second one is that if, I, if I'm on your side, if you line up ideological, ideologically with me, I can never disagree with you or oppose you at any turn. So both are completely false, and it's really causing a breakdown in our ability to discuss important issues politically, morally, socially, and religiously. Um, where was I? That'll happen frequently, by the way. The where was I part. Okay, so um, two extremes to avoid here. Uh, one, I think we, I hope to avoid this tonight, and we should always avoid our thinking, our discussions, what I would call a naive ecumenism, which ignores the very real and significant differences we have. Oh, can't we all just get along? It's all basically about God, doesn't it really? Nothing matters. Let's just ignore those things. I think that's an extreme to be, to be avoided. On the other hand, we should also try to avoid what I would call a hostile fundamentalism, which rapidly denounces, if you're a Protestant, Roman Catholicism and sees the Pope as the Antichrist, or if you're a Catholic, sees every de Protestant denomination as a cult and a false church, right? Two extremes for us to avoid, and I hope to avoid those here this evening. Uh, before we go further, I need to define some terms, terms that I'll be using throughout the evening. And so the first, uh, I want to be sure that we're clear, because I think we make assumptions about how we use different terms. The first term is the term, you, you, you might even have these, yeah, defining terms in your handout there, Catholic. The word Catholic, coming from uh, the Greek word katholikos, which means on the whole, or universal. So prior to the Reformation, Catholic meant universal, whole, complete church. That's, that's the reference. Roman Catholic means the church or religion with the Pope in Rome as its supreme authority on earth. So I'm, I'm making a distinction there between Catholic and Roman Catholic. Catholic meaning on the whole universal, one holy apostolic Catholic church, meaning universal church. And then Roman Catholic is the church in Rome under the leadership of the magisterium, the bishops, and the Pope. For the first thousand years of Christianity, there was no Roman Catholicism as we know it today. There was no Eastern Orthodoxy or Protestantism to, to, to divide or distinguish the two. There was just the one holy apostolic Catholic church, the church, 
with lots of disagreement and division and infighting at times, but there was no schism in 1066, was the great schism when uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church began and then the Protestant Reformation, which we'll talk in detail about in a few moments. But for, for and we end, let's see, where are we? Uh, oh, next term. Uh, Protestant. The term Protestant mean, it's from the Latin word protestan, which means to, to protest, to publicly declare against, quite literally. And it refers, uh, to, in, in our use, to Martin Luther's 95 Theses, the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, the, 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 those who protested against what they saw as abuses in the Church of Rome. Um, the church, by the way, the term Protestant was not originally applied to the Reformers but was later used to signify any group that protested against Rome, the Roman Catholic Church at all. Today it refers to any Christian church that is not Roman Catholic, uh, Eastern Orthodox or Coptic. Uh, so, uh, if you, by the way, if there's a question that's burning that I see something that's completely confusing, you could ask it, otherwise I'm just gonna keep going. I'm trying to talk slow, but I'm aware that in my head I'm not. <laughs> so I'll try to slow down. Slow down. Next term. Um, Evangelical. Uh, evangelical, from the Greek word euangelion, which literally means good news. It's where we get our, our word gospel from. Fundamentally, a believer in and a proclaimer of the gospel is an evangelical. It's not a denomination. This term is, is a pejorative term very often in our, in our current cultural media, isn't it? People talk about evangelicals with almost disdain, as if they're crazy, right-wing, fundamentalists, narrow, backward, chauvinistic, against women, you know, and that sort of thing. We can go on the list. Um, but it refers to the gospel, the proclamation, the belief in and proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, salvation for the world through Christ. That's the center of it. And in our, re religiously then, in, in terms of ecclesiastical terminology, there are <clears throat> four there's more than this, but four key distinctives that uh, would make someone evangelical. And by the way, you can be an evangelical Lutheran, an evangelical Baptist, an evangelical Catholic, an evangelical Methodist. This is not unique to any one particular denomination. Number one, a, a belief in personal conversion, when, that you must be born again. Perhaps you've heard that phrase. And Jesus says that, talks about a man, and would <clears throat> having a discussion and debate the guy says, well, how, how could you add me back into the womb a second time? He's talking about a spiritual rebirth. Uh, two, biblical authority. Evangelicals are committed to the authority uh, of, and the trustworthiness, reliability of the scriptures. And we'll talk a lot about that tonight as we go. The, what, what theologians call the inspiration and the inerrancy of the word of God. Third, personal evangelism. Evangelicals throughout history have had a, um, had a commitment to sharing their faith, to proclaiming the good news. In other words, an evangelical Christian of whatever denominational stripe is someone who thinks that the good news is so good you can't keep it to yourself. You talk about the goodness of God and his grace and forgiveness of sinners. And fourth, um, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Evangelicals are focused on who Christ is as revealed to us in the scriptures and what he did and what that means for us. And I can see right out the back that there's more cookies being put out. I just want to say this because I'm just looking at cookies as I'm talking. And that is that if for any reason you want to get up and go get something to eat or stretch your legs, feel free. It's just not a classroom that you can come and go as you please. I want to make sure you feel free to do that. Okay, so let's see, where are we now? Let's, let's talk history. Who likes history? Who doesn't like history, right? You should not raise your hand because the rest of us do. Um, let's, do let's, let's do a little brief run through of, um, uh, where are we in the outline? I got to stay with you on the outline. Oh, yeah, this is, we're not on the history part yet. This is, this is a non-outline section. Um, I'll give you a little brief sketch of uh, church history. This is going to be ridiculously abbreviated and like a 500,000 foot view. So uh, Jesus is crucified, resurrected, and ascends into heaven in the early in the first century. Acts chapter 2, you can go home and read that tonight, is the story of the birth of the church. We, Catholic or Protestant, we all have, that's our shared heritage and our shared roots. Go home and read Acts 2. That's the story of how the church began. It's fascinating stuff. And we share that heritage. Um, it begins at Pentecost in Jerusalem and spreads rapidly under Roman persecution. Rome at that time was not exactly friendly to Jews and not to this, what they viewed as a sect or a cult within Judaism, the Christ ones, the Christ followers, 
the people of the way, they, the, the church grew rapidly under a hostile environment in Rome uh, for about the first 300 years. Then in 325 AD, Emperor Constantine converts to Christianity and later declares Rome to be a Christian empire. Christianity now spreads by conquest and coercion as an official religion of Rome rather than by, under opposition. So we, for, for 300 years, you know, give or take, Christians are opposed and oppressed, uh, and sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the emperor, uh, in, the, in the world. And then at about 325 AD, things change, Constantine is emperor, and all of a sudden Christians are, are elevated to the point of, of they, have, they have official status in the empire, and now the faith begins to spread officially. This is the beginning of what historians call Christendom, when the world becomes Christianized to one degree or the other. And again, I'm painting with a very broad brush here. Um, this happens throughout the Middle Ages. In 1054 AD, the Great Schism, which is between East and West, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the West, Rome versus who knows the other city that was vying for power at the time. Anybody know? History buffs? Starts with a C. Constantinople and Rome, right? Between Greek and between Latin, the Western Church and the Eastern Church, a major divide, the first major divide in our, in our history, happens in 1054 AD. And then um, the medieval church following that, I'm talking about the West now, the medieval church, the Roman church, becomes wealthy, powerful, and extremely political in Europe. Shortly hereafter, we get the Holy Roman Empire with Charlemagne. Perhaps you remember that stuff from your history classes and so forth. And, um, and this is also the era of the Crusades. When the, when the Western Church in Rome, so this is the first divide, right? You have East and West. The Western Church in Rome now is uh, becoming increasingly politically powerful, wealthy, some would say corrupt. And the Crusades are launched in various phases over the period of about 300 years. In 1517 AD, a German monk named Martin Luther protests something against Rome. A German Augustinian Roman Catholic monk teaching in a theological seminary in Wittenberg, Germany. He's a Catholic, he's a priest, he's a monk. Nails to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, a list of 95 objections, 95 theses, perhaps you've heard about this. 95 things he says that the church in Rome needs to change, needs to address, needs to reform. It did not begin as a, an attempt to break off and start something new. It was not in Luther's heart or mind or many of the early reformers to break with Rome. They saw the church is, is straying, it's becoming too corrupt, it's becoming too political. We need a return to the true gospel and that was at the heart of it. We'll talk more about that. In, in fact, since we're on history and off the outline, let me just continue. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the region in Germany was known as Saxony at the time. And in a little village called Judenbach, which is not maybe 30 miles or so from Wittenberg, um, this was the last stop on a tour for a man named Johann Tetzel. Anybody know Johann Tetzel? Probably not. Johann Tetzel is an interesting guy. Go home and Google him tonight. He was sent by Pope Leo X on a tour, basically a fundraising mission in the 16th century to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica. How, anybody ever been to, to the, the papal city? Anybody ever been to St. Peter's? You seen the basilica? That beautiful, magnificent, incredible structure was, they were raising money to continue the construction and complete this, and they were, they were running out of funds, and so Tetzel was a brilliant fundraiser. And his primary method for raising funds, this is, this is not, this is, I, I'm trying not to give this any kind of slant. This is historical stuff here that Tetzel was the selling of what was known as indulgences, specifically papal indulgences. And that his, this is the primary means for fundraising. And he would go from village to town to town and basically offer people the opportunity to purchase or attain a partial or a plenary in papal indulgence. Now, we'll get into this, what this was a little later, but the Roman Catholic Church has taught and still teaches that while God alone can forgive sin, the church has the power to forgive the temporal punishments of sin. That is the earthly punishments of sin. And indulgence then is granted by the church to remove an individual's suffering for sin after this life. We'll talk more about purgatory later. Um, but Pope Benedict then the 16th was doling out indulgences just a few years ago. This is not an, only a medieval practice. 
In fact, if you might remember 2000, the great year of Jubilee, when Pope John Paul II put out his papal bull declaring it the year of Jubilee, the, the, the whole latter two-thirds of that papal bull is about how God's people, faithful Catholics, should obtain indulgences for their loved ones, family, and friends. Anyway, back to Judenbach. This is the last stop on Tetzel's tour of Saxony. He was quite a showman. You can imagine him. He would talk about the fact that you have loved ones. Your mother is, is languishing and in, in, in burning for her in purgatory. You could free her, but you won't. He would paint this picture for people, and they would be moved. I want to free those that I love. And they would give, and the money poured into Rome. Luther, who's a Roman Catholic monk and a priest, hears about this. He's been hearing about it, but now it's at his back door. It's in Judenbach, only a few miles from Wittenberg, and he's riled up about it. At the same time, he's been studying the Word of God, pouring over it. God's been speaking to his heart, and that's the sort of the match that lit the spark, which became the, the Protestant Reformation. So he tells about what's going on in Tetzel's show, and he was deeply disturbed by it. He uh, spoke out strongly against the practice, and remember, he's a Catholic priest teaching in a Catholic seminary. He said it was tantamount to selling the forgiveness of sin, and therefore a perversion of the biblically re revealed gospel of Jesus Christ. Luther's protest sparked a heated debate in the region. It spreads like wildfire, and word of it reaches Rome. Eventually, the controversy prompted Luther to write these theses and nail them to the castle door. Um, they're centered on this issue of indulgence, so they're not exclusively about that. His 32nd thesis reads this way. Those who believe that through indulgences they will be made sure of their salvation, they will be eternally damned, and so will their teachers. His 36th thesis. Every Christian who is truly repentant has a right to full remission of sin and guilt, even without letters of indulgence from Rome. And he goes on. We'll stop with the whole story there. But that's, that's the, so I want to give you a little context. It's not as if Luther is just an on, a troublemaker sitting around going bored in his, in his monk cell. Now what can I do to stir up a little, a little excitement in my life? There's a real heated debate going on at this time, and he's sort of the match or the, the, the tip of the spear, if you will. Okay, a little pre-Reformation history now. Jan Hus, John Hus, anybody ever been to the Czech Republic and seen his statue in the square where he was uh, burned at the stake? You can read about his story there. John Hus um, was a remarkable reformer, uh, pre-Reformation reformer. And then, I can't see on this thing. Oh, Johann Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press in 1454. The first book ever printed with this movable. Now, there were printing, I didn't actually know this uh, until a few years ago when I was, there were, there were printing presses before, but it, it was the only, they, were, they, were, they would uh, copy and press what you had written by hand. This is the first movable type press, which you can understand. All of a sudden now, information is, is mass available for the first time in human history. The first book ever printed was, the, what, what was a copy of the, what we call the Gutenberg Bible. By the way, there are believed to be 22 of these full or partial Gutenberg Bibles uh, in existence. Even to have one page of one of the original Gutenberg Bibles that still exist, that to own one page would be worth in excess of $20 million. It's amazing, isn't it? So I'm looking. Right? I'm like going, I'm becoming like American pickers looking for them. Right? Anyway, the first Bible printed was the Latin Vulgate Bible. That Vulgate means common tongue. It was the Bible written in the common tongue of man. And by the way, that was uh, an, a central thrust of the pre-Reformation period and the early Reformation period was to get the word of God into the language of, of the common people. <clears throat> so... So anyway, okay, to Luther then, the medieval church, um, oh, we got Zwingli as well, also a Swiss reformer, who once famously said, for God's sake, do not put yourself at odds with the word of God, for truly it will persist as surely as the Rhine follows its course. One can perhaps dam it up for a while, but it is impossible to stop it. It's a great quote. Don't oppose the word of God, was his, 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 his statement. Did, did not move? Ah, Okay. This is from Luther. You can read this. I labor diligently and anxiously as to how to understand Paul's words in Romans 1.17. Now, let's, let's go back a bit. This is prior to his 95 Theses. He's wrestling with this in his soul, in his study. And at the same time, the selling of indulgence and stuff is going on. And so these things, what's happening in his heart and what's happening in the world are coming to a convergence. 
<clears throat> he says, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. I saw that, so Paul says, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. To Luther and to a Roman Catholic at that time and still today, the righteousness of God was something you had to attain. It was a heavy burden. He says, I saw the difference that law is one thing and gospel another. I broke through. And as I had formerly hated the, the expression, the righteousness of God, because it felt like an impossible standard he could never measure up to, I now began to regard it as my dearest and most com comforting word, so that this expression of Paul's became to me, in very truth, a gate to paradise. You, you kind of have in that statement a summation of one of the key distinctions, which we'll come to a little later. So that's what's going on with Luther, and others jump on the bandwagon. The debate begins to sort of, the fire is, begins to spread. The medieval Roman church responds with condemnation and aggression. I wonder in my heart sometimes, or in my mind, what would have happened if, if, the, if the response in Rome would have been different? What, what, if, what would have happened if, if at that time in Rome, uh, if, if people near the Pope or the Pope himself or the people in, in positions of power would have humbled themselves enough to listen, say, hey, let's not go crazy. Maybe there's some things we could listen to here. What, what, would, what would our history have been, looked like if it had not been so antagonistic and hostile? But it, that was the way it was. Human beings were involved on both sides and things went from, from uh, tense to um, <laughs> really antagonistic very fast. In 1545 AD, the Council of Trent with the beginning of the Council of Trent, it lasted a number of years, almost a decade, and it, it was um, a counter-reformation movement. It was really a response to sort of curb the growing re reformation movement and to, um, <clears throat> to combat this, this, what they viewed as rebellion. The Roman Catholic Church did not, did not, did make some very, did, I should say did, did make some very good attempts at reform in the Council of Trent. You can read through the Council of Trent canons if you have never done that. Whatever your background is, it's fascinating reading. There are some very real, honest, even humble and, and, and um, admission of errors and we need to reform this and so forth. However, on the issues of indulgences and papal authority and what justifies the person before God, Ro the Roman church was unwilling to bend or move or even listen. And the, the canons of Trent have never been denied or appealed by Rome. Indeed, they cannot be. And that is still at the heart of the debate. And we'll come to that a little later on. <clears throat> so, some of you have probably heard about, um, well, we're, we're way past this. This is too tiny. I thought this would be an easy way to do it. It's really confusing. Yeah, I said all that, didn't I? Yep, okay. La, 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 la. Where are we? Ah, okay, good. Some of you may have heard of the five solas of the Reformation. Jenny Schulenberg, she's in the back somewhere, has a sweatshirt with them on it, which I don't know where she got that, but it's kind of nerdy, but cool. <clears throat> I tried it on, her sweatshirt. Now it doesn't fit her anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, these are, we'll go through these uh, together. Uh, if you want to take notes, you can put these things down here. We're back on the outline now on page two. Um, first is what they called sola scriptura. This means literally in Latin, the Bible or scripture alone. Now, the Bible alone is the ultimate authority for the Christian. Martin Luther writes, my conscience is held captive to the word of God unless I am overcome with evident testimony from scripture, scripture, for I believe neither the Pope nor the councils since they have often erred and contradicted one another. In other words, I, he's saying the word of God is my ultimate and final authority. Now, what Sola Scriptura does not mean it is not a talking about that we need no other source of revelation. The reformers were not saying that just you and your Bible, no, one can, no, no other person, no other teacher, no other leader can ever help you. That's not what they were saying. They're also not saying that the, there are no other sources of truth outside of the Scripture. Of course there are. But ultimately, all other sources of truth, be they, be they uh, um, evidential, experiential, relational, they all are subservient to the Word of God including those who have teaching offices in the church, including bishops and the pope. That's what sola scriptura means. Um, second, sola gratia. Again, Latin phrase for grace alone. The salvation is by grace alone, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. This was and is central to Reformation theology. Absolutely crucial. Salvation is purely a gift of God's grace. And three, sola fide, Faith alone. The way we access God's grace is by faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. 
justification, how we are made right with God, is by faith alone. We are justified, i.e. made right with God, by faith in Christ's grace alone. Uh, this is a stark contrast to Roman Catholic doctrine of grace plus the mass plus the sacraments, and we'll come to that later. Fourth, sola Christos, Christ alone. Jesus Christ is the sole mediator between God and man. We do not need, the reformers believe, a priest to mediate for us. Christ has done that, has done that at the cross, is our sacrifice, and intercedes for us even now. And then five, sola Deo Gloria, Solio Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. God is sovereign over all things, and his desire for his people is that we glorify him. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, what is the chief end of man? To enjoy God and to glorify him forever. Now, this is not necessarily a point, this last one, where Roman Catholicism and evangelical Protestants would disagree. However, the Reformers were concerned about what they viewed as wealth, corruption, and self-glorification of Rome at that time. Um, and so that's, that's why the fifth one was put in there, I think. Okay? So, let the five solos, let's talk about where we agree, what we share. First, three shared creeds. Are they up there? Yeah, they're up there. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. All these creeds, by the way, if you're not familiar, you, some of you grew up saying them in your churches or you have studied them perhaps or you remember parts of them. Um, the, the creeds were for people that were partially literate or illiterate. They were ways of them to affirm what, they, what, what was true from the word of God and from the teaching of the church for those that didn't have access to the, uh, to the scriptures themselves in writing or could not read them. We share a belief. Let's see, where are we here? Oh, there we go. Good. I'll, I'll, I'll talk while you write. There's 12 fill-ins here. Some of you type A people are like, oh, please don't go fast. There's a lot to write down here. So I'll take my time. These are some things that we believe in. Roman Catholics, evangelical Protestants believe in the Trinity. We love and serve and worship a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God in three distinct persons of one nature, one substance. In fact, um, at Athanasius at the Council of Nicaea, this is fascinating reading, the whole heated debate was over a single portion of a Greek word, whether or not Jesus should be called of the same substance, of, of one substance, homoousis. Uh, never mind about that. Or, or, uh, but th that was the debate. Is Christ Jesus of the same substance and nature as God himself? Athanasius was saying absolutely he is. And there was, you can read about the heresy in the debate. We share that belief. Belief in the sovereignty of God. That God is in control. Nothing is outside of his knowledge, his power, or the scope of his control. God is sovereign over all things. We share a belief in the person of Jesus Christ, the historical, verifiable person of Jesus of Nazareth, as revealed to us in the Gospels. We share a belief in his virgin birth, in his incarnation, in his miracles, his sacrificial death on the cross, his bodily resurrection, his ascension, and his future return in glory. All of that we share. We share a belief in the sinfulness of humanity. That we are human beings born into sin. It's not just the compounding effect of all the wrongs we do, but it's in us. And we are powerless on our own to change our sinful condition. We share a belief in the need for grace. That grace is God's solution to the sinful condition of humanity. We share a belief in the inspiration of Scripture, that if you have your Bible with you tonight, if what you hold in your hand, it's, it's a remark. I mean, when you think about, we are, we are racing through Reformation history. Men died, died to get the Word of God into the hands of the common person, spent their life laboring in, 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 by candlelight. Think of the arthritis those guys must have had to copy the Scriptures so that we could have it. You can go on Amazon or on your phone and get every version known to man on your Kindle, on your tablet. It's remarkable what we have. And what we have, we believe and we share the belief, is not just words on a page. It's God's word. In, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, human beings wrote these words and God guided it, he inspired it, and he has directed it and preserved it down to this day. We share that belief. We share a belief in the return of Christ in glory that Jesus Christ will return, and when he returns, it will not be like the lamb, it will be like the lion. 
And when he returns, he will judge the world. And all knees will bow and every tongue confess. Some willingly, some not so much. But that's, that's what we share that belief, that there is a, a day coming. And the final judgment, I mentioned that. So when you think about this, this is remarkable what we share. Why are we even having this discussion? That's a lot, and that's not even the half or the, that's just a fraction of what we share. Clearly, Roman Catholics and evangelicals have a lot of common ground, and we should not ignore these things. We should celebrate these things. We should embrace these things. Simply because there remain some serious differences doesn't mean we should ignore much that we share. Evangelical Protestants, actually, I would, I would say that go so far as to say this, and this may, may raise questions for some of you. I believe that evangelical Protestants, of which I'm one, many of you are as well, have more in common with faithful, traditional Roman Catholics than we do with liberal Protestants. I think that's true. And I think we also have to say, this is just theologically, doctrinally, we also have to acknowledge that Roman Catholics in our culture have often been out front of issues that we have lagged behind on. Protection of the unborn, for one. The sanctity of marriage, for another. So there's a lot that we share, doctrinally, theologically, socially. It's a good thing. I, I, I praise God for that. One prominent evangelical theologian was asked the pointed question, what separates Catholics from Protestants? This might be in your notes, I don't know. No, it's not. Is it? No, it's not. He was asked, the, the, um, the, R.C. Sproul was asked the question, what separates Catholics from Protestants? He responded, nothing and everything. Typical theologian's answer. A paradoxical and keenly insightful answer, actually, when you look at all the doctrinal and theological common ground, it appears that nothing at all separates us. But when you look closely at the areas of difference, it seems like everything does. We're going to move to that in a few moments here. John Jefferson Davis, a Roman Catholic theologian out of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, says that evangelicals can affirm about 85% of what Roman Catholics believe, what Rome teaches. 85%. But what about that other 15%? Where do we disagree? Oh, I, there it is. I knew it was there somewhere. This wasn't in your notes. It was on the <laughs> back um, Now, there are lots of... Um, this is where things can get a bit complicated. We could talk about Mariology and prayers to saints and veneration versus worship and the number and role of the sacraments and the issue of papal indulgences. And we could go on and on about all the, 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 the nuances and I'm no expert in those things. But I think the divide between Roman Catholicism and evangelical Protestantism really boils down to these two things, two central and foundational issues. Because quite frankly, you can go to the Methodist church or the Lutheran church or the Episcopal church or the Congregational church or the non-denominational church or the Bible church or the community church or the Baptist church, and you can find areas of disagreement about the role of women, about worship style, about any number of things. That's not unique to Catholics and, even, and Protestants. These two things are significant. Th these two things are the reason I and our church felt compelled to have this, this session, these two issues. Authority, spiritual and ecclesiastical church authority, and salvation, justification and sanctification, what makes us a person right with God. Authority. This has been a significant issue for a long time. The early reformers called it the formal cause of the Reformation. Basically, Roman Catholics affirm a kind of a triad of authority. Those three... Uh, um, uh, where are we? I'm not using this thing next time. Uh, the triad. Scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. Let's talk about those. Uh, magisterium uh, refers to the official teaching office of the Roman Catholic Church. It's not the Pope alone, it's the Pope and the bishops and the official teaching. What comes at what is put into papal bulls, into catechisms, into, into decrees, the official teaching of the Catholic Church. And that's what I want to respond to. Um, so the, there's some implications of this Roman Catholic view of authority. Uh, first is the Petrine doctrine, what Catholics call, that is the Pope is descended from Peter, a direct line, apostolic succession. Perhaps you've heard it referred to that way as well. Um, <clears throat> papal supremacy, 
Um, perhaps you've heard the term infallibility. We'll talk in detail about what, what that is and what that isn't in a few moments. Uh, also, the individual access to Scripture is subordinate to the magisterium. This is a crucial one, and it was for the Reformers. And that is the, uh, the, <clears throat> the individual Christ follower of whatever religious stripe. Your reading of the Word of God and your uh, ability to discern what it says to you and, and, and listen to the Spirit's voice as you read God's revealed Word to you is set subordinate to what the official magisterium, the church, teaches you it says. Now, we would all agree that it would be best if those things lined up, right? But the Reformers said, you do not need an expert to tell you what it means. You need to, you need to have access to God's Word yourself, which does not mean you should not come under authority of the church. There was a, there's a difference there. Do you understand the distinction? They're saying the magisterium sits over top of the individual's access to the Word of God in Roman Catholic official teaching and doctrine. Also, it, this, this view of authority leads to extra-biblical doctrines that are added. The Roman Catholic position is that all three, Holy Scripture, tradition of the church, and the teaching of the magisterium, all three make up God's Word. So if you ask, and I have had this debate and, and talked with Catholic friends, even priests, do you believe the authority of the Word of God? They would say, yes, absolutely. However, we define that differently. For a Roman Catholic, officially, the Word of God is the triad, the compilation of God's Word, the tradition of the church, and the teaching of the magisterium. Those go together to make, that is God's Word to God's people. For the Protestant, God's Word is the Scripture. Those other things may be useful at times and helpful, and God uses them to communicate His Word, but this is God's Word. So you see, there's an important distinction of definition there. <clears throat> when we talk about what is God's Word and what its role is. Evangelical Protestants, not surprisingly, have a very different view of <clears throat> what authority is. Basically, boiling down to the Reformation cry of sola scriptura. The clarity, sufficiency, and final authority of the Bible in all matters of life and faith. All other authorities to the Protestant view, Evangelical Protestant view, are subservient, sit underneath Scripture. Evangelicals criticize Roman Catholics often for putting human traditions on the same level as God's Word. It's a valid critique, I think. You can't have competing authority structures, we'll say. Either God's Word's authoritative or it's not. Catholics, on the other hand, criticize even evangelical Protestants, rightly so, for letting anybody interpret the Bible however they want and having competing interpretations. Both are, both are something we should listen to. And we'll talk about that as we go. So let's talk, what is sola scriptura in detail here? If we're gonna, if that's the, where are we? We'll leave that up there for a while. I'm not sure when that comes. There's a big gap between what's here and what's there. <clears throat> what is sola scriptura? Uh, the Bible is dire the direct revelation from God, his inspired word. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed. Breathed out by God, inspired by God's breath. Same constructional sentence as when God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter, that he breathed the breath of life. Same Greek construction when Jesus breathed onto his disciples and said to them to receive the Holy Spirit. That God breathed out comes from, from God himself, the word of God, his, his, the scripture. The Bible is sufficient and complete. It does not need any additions to make it relevant. In fact, we're forbidden to add to it. The Bible is authoritative. It's the sole and final authority. The Bible is clear. Main things are plain things, theologians will say. The Bible interprets itself. The clear teaching of the Scripture interprets the unclear parts of the Scripture. That's what sola scriptura in, in authority means. It comes straight from God. It's sufficient and complete. We don't lack anything. It doesn't need any help. And it's authoritative over our lives, and it's clear, and it interprets itself. What Sola Scriptura is not, I said this before, it's not a claim that the Bible is, contains all knowledge. It's not an exhaustive account of everything. Uh, Bill Bryson wrote a little book. He, anybody ever read any Bill Bryson books? It's a funny little travel writer. He wrote a book that I read called A Brief History of Everything. <laughs> it's very ambitious. It's very much too thin a book to be actually accurate. But the Bible is not a claim to be that. There are, God reveals and communicates in ways through relationships, through experiences, uh, through even, even people who do not, e even scientific discovery. 
philosophical insight for those that would not even claim to know God. That, is still, that truth still belongs to God. All of that is in harmony with and sits underneath the authority of Scripture. So uh, it's not a denial of teaching authority outside of the church or even of the church. 1 Timothy 3.15 talks about our need for the authorities. But the church is not infallible and its authority is subordinate to the Bible. I'm a, an ordained Baptist minister called by vote, really, of the people of this church and put in a position of spiritual authority and, and leadership and ministry to the people, the people of God in this community. I hold that role um, with great humility and respect and reverence. My interpret, thus saith the Lord, God's word is perfect without error and its authority. My understanding of it is often flawed. I have to submit myself to the teaching of the church throughout the centuries. I have to submit myself to the direction of the Holy Spirit and to the, my peers. I'm not infallible. The Word of God is. And so we come to it humbly and openly. So, and it's also not a claim that the Bible will always be interpreted correctly or that there will never be any disagreements. That's not what Holy Scripture means. There will be. Our history shows us that. The basic Roman Catholic response to this is that God's word is found in the Bible and in the tradition of the church, but since you cannot understand the Bible correctly on your own, you must submit without reservations to the Pope and the magisterium who will tell you essentially what it means for you. That's putting it bluntly, but that's coming right out of the canons of Trent. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Now, brothers, I have ap applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will take pride in one man over against another. What is Paul saying here? <laughs> He's telling us not to take pride in one man over against another. Don't go beyond what is written. What was written is, is as far as you should go and it's far enough. 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the central text on the inspiration of Scripture. And by the way, Roman Catholics would not disagree with this, this part. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And finally, Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears these words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Now, that's, I, I, you can't get clearer than that on the sufficiency of the word of God. The Council of Trent emphatically proclaimed the Bible is alone, is not sufficient for all matters of faith and life, but must be interpreted and applied by the Roman Catholic Church. We'll talk about that here in a few moments. The Council of Trent says this, uh, a couple of important uh, clarifications. Church authority versus individual interpretation is a false dilemma. It's one I think that's often raised in this. The, the, the debate is not between church authority and individual interpretation. Though that's a false dichotomy or, or choice. You do not have to choose one over the other. They actually strengthen each other, and we see that in Scripture. Second clarification, it's not necessary for someone or some office to be infallible in order to be authoritative. Infallibility, with the, 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 inca the being incapable of making an error, is not necessary to be authoritative. Governments are certainly not infallible, and yet they have authority over us. How many of you are parents here tonight? Parents, are you infallible? You'd like your kids to believe so, but if they're past eight years old, they know you're not right, or maybe, maybe two years old, depending on your family. They know early that you're not infallible, yet you still have authority, God-given spiritual authority over them, even though you make mistakes. So it's not necessary for church leaders and officers, bishops and so forth, pastors, priests, to be considered infallible in order to be authoritative. And to a degree, Roman Catholics would agree with that. Uh, Father, uh, the <coughs> Father Reverend Stephen Keenan, uh, one of the, wrote one of the most popular Roman Catholic catechisms of the early and mid-19th century. In it, he actually denies the doctrine of papal infallibility and called it a, a terrible Protestant invention. However, in 1869, 11 years after he wrote his uh, catechism, during the First Vatican Council, Pope Pius IX presided over many decrees which made papal infallibility official Catholic dogma, even claimed it to be a teaching received from the beginning of the Christian faith. Vatican I said, this is not something we're inventing now, we're just affirming what's always been, and that is 
the authority of the magisterium and papal infallibility. Regarding apostolic succession, I don't know where we are on the... Oh, yeah, you can read this. Um, I can't read it here. <laughs> Furthermore, in order to restrain uh, petulant spirits, it decrees that no one relying on his own skill shall in matters of faith and of morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine Resting the sacred scripture to his own senses, presumed to interpret the said sacred scripture contrary to the sense which Holy Mother Church, whose it, whose it is to judge the true sense and interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, hath held and doth hold, or even contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers, even though such interpretations were never intended to be at any time published. Contraveners shall be made known by their ordinaries and shall be punished with the penalties by law established. That's hard to read, even hard to understand. But what it's telling us is that the tradition of the church is authoritative, even though it was never intended to be written down. It's interpretation. So, so there's official Catholic teaching magisterium. That's, that's the catechism. That's the written declaration of the Roman church. There's the scripture, which we have. We'll talk about the different books in the Catholic Bible at the end. And then there's the tradition, which was never intended to be written down, which is a remarkable thing. All those things then form the, the Word of God to the Roman Catholic. Again, I'm just highlighting the very important difference in our issue of authority. Regarding apostolic succession, the New Testament does talk about following the traditions and teachings of the apostles. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. I don't know where we are on the outline. Page five, somewhere, good. <clears throat> Acts two, verse 42, Ephesians two twenty. It does talk about the need and the importance of tradition and following the teachings of the apostles. This is because, and here's an important distinction. This is because they were living eyewitnesses and authorities established by Christ himself. Christ called them, Christ gave them authority. They were eyewitnesses to his life. And when they died, there was no longer a living apostolic authority. That is why they wrote down what they taught, what they saw, what they experienced, what, what the Spirit of God revealed to them. That's why the Word of God is so important to us. The Roman Catholic position is yes, but we still have a direct line of apostolic succession and authority. The, the Protestant would say, no, we don't. Now, that's an important uh, point of divergence. This is why the Holy Spirit inspired them to write these things down. This is what we call the New Testament, and this is why that's so important. Their apostolic authority, Protestants believe, we believe, the Bible teaches, that their apostolic authority is passed down to us, not by a, a genealogical lineage, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. This is, their, this is our heritage. This is our inheritance. This is their authority passed down to us, the Word of God, not tracing it back and we can get into the, the problems with that later. So apostolic succession, in case you're wondering, it's the supposed direct line of the bishops stretching back to the apostles and to Peter, who was the supposed first pope. The concept of transmission, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says to his younger brother in the faith, Timothy, these things which you have heard from me be faithful to teach to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others also. There's three generations in there, aren't there? What you, Paul, what you've heard from me, where did Paul get it? Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road knocked him off his horse, right? And said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I've got other plans for your life. And then he became a follower of Christ. So what was revealed to him by Christ, he taught to these men and to Timothy, who he's writing to, and says, now, Timothy, what I want you to do is teach these things to other people who will be faithful and qualified to pass it on again. And so it goes. Spiritually speaking, we can all trace our lineage back to Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, I'll turn there because I don't have it. Matthew 3, verse 9, warns against pride of boasting in, in, in our heritage. When he's talking here to the, the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders who could trace their heritage directly back to Moses. And in verse 9, he says to them, And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Now, I think he's not speaking to Protestant ministers or Roman Catholic uh, priests because they're not around at this time, but he's making a, a point that I think we can apply today. Our pride 
well, first of all, our pride should never be spiritual pride because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. But our lineage and our heritage is not from being able to trace the line of authority back to Peter. It is in what Christ, by his Holy Spirit, has passed down to us and given to us and preserved for us his word and his gospel. Okay, this, uh, yeah, let's move on here. Oh, I didn't read this. St. Alphonsus wrote, uh, I'm not reading that, you can read it. <laughs> Shall I read it? It's kind of a fun test with my head turned sideways. These traditions, which are the unwritten word of God, have the same authority as the written word of God. Talk about church tradition now. Traditions are necessary that belief may be given to many articles of faith about which nothing at all exists in scriptures. Catch that? Traditions are necessary that they may help us believe in articles of faith of which no, about which nothing at all exists in scriptures. There's a full-on admission. You're not going to find this in the Bible, but God says, in other words. So that these truths have come to us only from the, from the font of tradition. Tradition is a source of revelation distinct from yet equal to Holy Scripture and goes beyond the data of Scripture. This is a dogma of faith from the Council of Trent and from the Vatican Council. These are Catholic teachings. And again, clearly there's a Protestant disagreement here, a very significant one. But so I put this in here so you'd know that, that, that this is not, and I'm not, I, I would disagree with this, but this is official Catholic teaching. I'm not trying to spin it a particular way. Uh, let's talk now about something else. Uh, apostolic succession, we got to that. We are, see if I just keep moving my finger, it would help me know where I am. Papal infallibility. The doctrine of papal infallibility, okay, was formalized as official dogma at the First Vatican Council in 1869-1870. Um, it was also put into uh, practice in the, in the Council of Trent and the Counter-Reformation. It's essentially a limited infallibility. I think many Protestants don't understand this, and I, quite frankly, for many years didn't really understand it. It's not saying the Pope never sins. That's not what the Catholic Church teaches. It's not saying the Pope never makes a mistake as, an, as a man. Of course he does. It's saying when the Pope speaks what's known as ex cathedra, literally from the chair, when he speaks as authoritatively on behalf of the church in matters of faith and morals, and he intends to do so, says this is an ex cathedra statement, then he, in that context, is incapable of error. That's what infallibility means. It's not saying anything that any Catholic priest or bishop or pope ever says can't be wrong. That's not what they're claiming. Um, it does not mean, okay, I just already said all that. It applies to the bishops as a whole, not individually, as well as to the pope. So the, the doctrine of infallibility in the Roman Catholic teaching also applies not just the, to the individual pope, but to the bishops as a college, as a group. When they speak with one voice on matters of faith and morals and, and speak officially in their role as bishops, they also are infallible. Uh, this is, there's special uh, infallibility, general infallibility, and so forth. Um, the Vatican II explanation of the doctrine of infallibility. Let's see if we have that here. Oh, we do. How about that? Holy cow. In case you can't see it like I can't see it, we teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra from the chair, that is, when in discharge of the office of pastor and doctor of all Christians, by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine regarding faith and morals to be held by the universal church by the divine assistance promised to him in the blessed Peter, is possessed of that infallibility which the divine redeemer willed that his church should be endowed in defining doctrine regarding faith or morals, and that therefore such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not of the consent of the church irreformable. And it's pretty, it's wordy but clear about the doctrine of infallibility. Uh, infallibility the magisterium, I mentioned this too. The Roman Catholic also, Church also teaches that when the bishops speak as one, here's another statement. The Vatican II explains the doctrine of infallibility this way. Although the individual bishops do not enjoy the per, uh, prerogative of infallibility individually, they can nevertheless proclaim Christ's doctrine infallibly. This is so even when they are dispersed around the world, provided that while maintaining the, the bond of unity among themselves and with Peter's successor, and while teaching authentically on a matter of faith and morals, they concur in a single viewpoint as the one which must be held conclusively. So in other words, when the bishops, even if they're not together physically, agree and the Pope agrees, that's an infallible statement um, coming, coming from the, the authority of the church. 
Okay, let's talk about a few historical problems with uh, infallibility. We're, we're on page six somewhere in here, right? Okay. Um, the, the, anti, anybody know what an anti-pope is? It's a fun word to say, but anybody know what it means? Popes who were, uh, an anti-pope is a pope who uh, is no pope at all, <laughs> basically. It's uh, uh, someone who claimed to be pope, even ascended to the role of pope, but was later either denounced, excommunicated, cast out, murdered, uh, knocked aside, or, or voted out, whatever. So it's a pope who either claimed the authority or had the authority for a brief time, but the church now retroactively looks back and says that guy wasn't legit. And they have to do that because there wasn't more than one pope at certain times in, their hist in, in, our, in history. Um, uh, let's see. In fact, there have been more than one infallible pope excommunicating each other, sometimes three uh, in, in, in history. So the Oxford Dictionary of Christian History, there have been at least 35 anti-popes in the history of the church. Boniface the seventh had Benedict the sixth murdered and himself installed in, in, as pope in, in, in 984 AD. Um, the church now looks back and says, ah, that guy probably wasn't infallible or, or acting on behalf of Christ. And so we, he's an anti-pope. Uh, 768 AD, Pope Constantine II uh, had a feud with a man named uh, Pope Philip, who was pope for a day. So he, he, he beat out Constantine. It's a fascinating historical discussion and, or re, to read about this. Philip won in like a, a political struggle in Rome, becomes pope. He's pope for a day, and he decides, I don't like this, and he goes back to his monastery. <laughs> I think that we should, like, that'd be a good, if you're president, ah, this is not what I thought it was. This is hard. I don't want to do this job. And he left. So Pope Constantine then, uh, all the while, is fighting with another, another pope named Stephen. Saint Hippolytus, this is a fascinating one, tried to have himself installed in opposition to Pope Callistus. In fact, tried to have Callistus murdered and opposed uh, another pope, uh, Urban, uh, opposed Urban I. Yet later on, so he's, he tries to have one pope murdered, tries to have himself installed, then later opposes Pope Urban I, and yet decades later he's canonized as a saint, which is interesting to me, in 235 AD. We could go on and on about that, but the, and I, I'm not trying to poke too much fun, although it is fun, I just like history, and there's funny things that people do in all stripes of history, sometimes sad things. But it, I think it does cast a shadow of doubt on the papal succession and on the doctrine of infallibility. There's also the issue of immoral popes, popes that were, are never uh, declared to be anti-popes by the Catholic Church, but just popes that didn't act like a pope should. Uh, pope Honorius was condemned as a heretic by the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Remember, the, the, in the First Vatican Council, we're saying the, the uh, pope, uh, pope Pius is saying that the doctrine of infallibility is not a new thing. It's always been there. We're just affirming it now. So in the Sixth Ecumenical Council, Pope Honorius is declared retroactively to be a heretic. A heretic. Infallibility has been in play for the papal see from the beginning, Pope Pius says. And yet in the Sixth Ecumenical Council, they decide this guy who sat in the papal chair and spoke on behalf of, of, the, of the bishops in Rome was a heretic. Pope Christopher became Pope by forcibly dethroning his predecessor, Leo V, and putting him into prison. He was then driven from the chair by his successor, Sergius III. All three are considered legitimate uh, in, in papal succession, going back to Peter. Pope John VII, or the uh, 12th, and my Roman numerals are confusing me, was a coarse, immoral man whose life was such that Lateran uh, was spoken of him as a house of prostitution. His And the moral corruption in Rome became the subject of general uh, of ridicule under his regime. Um, Pope Clement VI imposed taxes, sold beneficiaries, and squandered the church riches on pompous banquets and receptions. Pope Alexander VI was known for murder, bribery, and selling uh, positions of authority in the Catholic Church. Again, all of these popes are in the, the apostolic succession. Pope Gregory VII and his successors used forged documents in order to expand the power of the papacy. Someone might say, okay, well, granted, granted, fine. People are imperfect. And there were some evil popes. What does that prove about the papacy as institution? Because we have to acknowledge there's evil people in positions of power in the Protestant church, in, in, in our governments, and throughout our history. This is not unique to Rome. I'm not suggesting that all popes were immoral like these ones. In fact, these are the exceptions by far, not the rule. There are some remarkable men in history that have held that position. Nor do we suggest here that immorality only affects the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Clearly it does not. But the point is, 
Roman Catholicism cannot follow the guidance of the scriptures to expose false teachers if they're not allowed to by the magisterium. If a pope has been lawfully elected, he must be considered a true pope. The vicar of Christ, the head of the church, no matter how morally or spiritually deficient he proves to be. Because he's pope. One Catholic author wrote, in all seriousness, even a bad and immoral pope cannot be deposed. The faithful can only pray for his conversion of heart. Did you hear that? Conversion of heart. Or that St. Joseph blessed him with a happy and speedy death if his behavior becomes scandalous. <laughs> At least he's honest. So, um, yeah, that's, that's enough of that, I think. I think. Again, I... I, 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 I sort of trembled at this when I was preparing this, thinking, who am I to talk about this? You know, I'm just an associate pastor at a Baptist church in the middle of nowhere in America. I don't speak, I'm not trying to speak with, um, with my own authority. I'm trying to say that I think this doctrine of papal infallibility and apostolic succession, I'm not alone in saying this, is error, is an error, is flawed. And then I give evidence for why that is. The other issue is the historical revisions, which we won't, um, well, the Peter problem. Shall we come back to that? Let's come back to that. The other issue is historical revisions. Uh, the problem of Galileo, some of you are familiar with this story. This is one example that there's revisionist history going on uh, in, in, in Roman Catholic doctrines. In 1633, Galileo condemned a heretic by Pope Paul V. Uh, later Popes Gregory uh, XV and Urban VIII were also involved in his trial. And the Inquisition in Rome found him to be vehemently suspect of heresy. And you know what Galileo was on trial for? A heliocentric view of the stars. That is, we do, we, the earth is not the center of the universe. We revolve around the sun. That was considered to be, you know, uh, for lots of confused uh, <laughs> astronomical and, uh, and spiritual religious reasons, a heresy. He was kept under house arrest for the rest of his life. In 1758, the Catholic Church stopped calling heliocentrism heresy. Just kind of said, okay, we accept that now. Good, good for them. And in 1970, 1979, Pope John Paul II called for a re-examination of the whole matter. I'm sure Galileo appreciated that. And in 1983, he declared both sides to be at fault and sort of said he's no longer a heretic or a suspect of heresy. Well, you were both ornery. Let's just let that go kind of thing, you know. And we won't, won't belabor the point. And again, this is not unique. The point I'm trying to make is this would be just a sad commentary on human being behavior in the positions of authority if it were not for the claim of papal infallibility and an epistolic succession. Um, now, let me say something about Protestants. Uh, we're not being totally honest as Protestants when we say we don't have traditions of our, that, are, that are not biblically based. Uh, we like to accuse the Roman church, perhaps, of having these traditions which are not biblically based. We've got our own at times. Take, for example, some denominations that do not drink alcohol or dance and think that's you're, you're, it's, it's an unforgivable sin if you do. You can't find that in Scripture. David danced in his linen ephod. That's a Hebrew word for underwear before the Lord. Um, Jesus' first miracle, for example. So it's not unique to the Roman Catholic Church to have traditions that are outside the Bible's teaching. But we don't call those traditions the Word of God and put them on a level with Scripture. Roman Catholic sacred tradition cannot be checked by the Scriptures because it's considered to be equal to the Scriptures. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. That's right out of the Vatican II. In the, in the Roman religion, tradition is uncorrectable and really unaccountable. It's raised to the level of holy scripture and thus opening wide the door to all sorts of errors. Here, here lies, this is really the fundamental difference between Roman and Protestant attitude to tradition and authority. We do not consider a particular doctrine as divinely revealed simply because it was transmitted down from antiquity. Error as well as truth can be passed on from generation to the next. There must be a more reliable standard to elevate and confirm the truthfulness of our beliefs. That's why the Word of God stands above all. Um, now, on the word of tradition, G.K. Chesterton, a faithful Roman Catholic, a brilliant man, and a great author, who I'm a fan of his, not just because he has two initials for a first name, but he once said in his book, Orthodoxy, great read, by the way, if you want to pick up the book, he said, tradition is the living faith of those long dead. It's a good thing. Tradition is not bad. It's not evil. That's not what we're saying. Not what I'm saying. Tradition is the living faith of those long dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of those still living. Isn't that great? Tradition is a good thing. 
We come from somewhere, spiritually speaking. We have a heritage. I think evangelicals have been guilty throughout history of like ignoring history pre-Reformation. Like Martin Luther came on this, like Jesus ascended and then nobody knows what happened until Luther came on the scene, right? We have a history that we share which is rich and good and it's full of errors too. So tradition is the living faith of those long dead. Hebrews chapter 11, the faith hall of fame, right? Go back home and read it. By faith Abraham, by faith Noah, by faith Moses, by faith Rahab. Right on down the list. And then in chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, a rich tradition, let us run with perseverance our race, marked out for us, focusing our eyes on Jesus. Okay, traditionalism is the dead faith of those of us still alive. Well, it's always been this way. This is the way we do it. No sense for why or where it comes from or what it means or how it changes us, just stuck in traditionalism. And I think Roman Catholics, Baptists, all kinds of Christians struggle with the difference. We hold on to the things we should be letting go of. And we let go of the things we should be holding on to. And God's word, I think, shows us the difference. Okay. I am so far off of the outline and the thing. The thing here. Problem of the keys. Okay, let's, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. If you have a Bible, you can turn there with me. Let's talk about Peter, the Pope, and stuff Jesus said. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Let's go, let's back up to 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Maybe the most profound question ever asked. Who, uh, the second most profound, excuse me, the most profound is coming up. What's the word on the street? What are people saying about me? Right? And they said, well, they don't know. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So in other words, Jesus says, what's the buzz about me? Interesting question. The disciples go, there's buzz, but nobody knows. There's a lot of disagreement, but they're talking about you. And then Jesus makes it personal, and he says, who do you say that I am? That's the most profound question. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. If you, don't, if you like to highlight or underline, underline that statement. That's the statement on which this whole passage turns. Jesus asks the question, the turning point in the passage, who do you say that I am? That's what matters, your view of who I am. Peter gets it right. He got a lot of things wrong, right? Get behind me, Satan, at one time, Jesus says to him. If, if Peter's the first pope, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that Jesus would not call him Satan. Anyway, he, got, he, he, was, he, he, he took a sword to cut off the, tem the temple guard's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. He got out of the boat and walked on water for a moment and then began to sink and freaked out. So Peter was an impetuous guy. He got a lot of things wrong, but he got this right and this matters above all things. Who do you say I am? You're Christ. You're the one. You're the Messiah. You're, you're God himself. Come down for us. Then Jesus says, and Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, that means son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He blesses him, why? Because of his profession of faith. I bless you because you get it. You recognize and accept who I am. And the reason you do that is not because you're so smart and you figured it out. The reason you're blessed and you, and you said that right is because my Father put that in your heart. That spiritual knowledge available to all of us, by the way. And then he says in verse 18, the words which we have fought over for centuries. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay, I, I'm not going to resolve this debate tonight, but I'm going to try. <laughs> but yeah, right. The, qu the central question is, is the church of Jesus Christ, is the church God's people in the world? I'm leaving off all other scriptures there. Is it built on Peter or Jesus Christ? I mean, it comes down to that. Because there's two, actually, we, we could get into the Greek words here. Peter, uh, God calls, Jesus calls Peter, Simon, he call, calls him, what does he call anybody know the name he uses in Greek? What? Petros, P-E-T-R-O-S, Petros, which means like pebble, small rock. You're a rock, you're a, you're a stone. And on this rock, he does not say Petros. 
he says Petra, which means like cliff, massive hunk of granite. That's the, the Greek word you do is talk about a, a, a monument, a monolith, a giant slab of stone, a, a, a rock cl cliff face. I'll build my church. He does not use the same word. Well, the objection among Catholic scholars is, well, Jesus spoke Aramaic, and Aramaic, there aren't two words, it's the same word, so it was just translated that way. Yes, by who? By Matthew, one of the disciples, right? Uh, I, I think if, and I think if there are, why not translate it, if, if it was just the same word, why not translate it Petros and Petros? Why use the feminine noun to describe a giant rock? The point, and we're not getting into all the details here, but the point is, when the, Roman, the, Roman, the Protestant position is this. When Jesus said to Peter, on this rock I'll build my church, he was not talking about Petros, little pebble Peter. He was talking about Peter's profession of faith, which he just blessed him for. Peter, you recognize who I am. It's on that faith in me that I'll build my church. That's what my church is built on. Faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And you're a, you're a little rock because you get it. And later on, Peter says, we're, we're a, we're, we are all living stones being built together to become a temple in which God dwells by his spirit. So it's a fascinating study. Uh, <clears throat> so the issue of the keys then. Um, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, if you go to the great cathedrals in Rome or in Europe, you'll see that it's the apostles uh, often lining the walls in stained glass. You can always pick out Peter. You know how? He's holding a set of car keys. No, he's hold, he usually has his arms crossed, and there are keys in his hand. Keys of the kingdom. That's, why, that's how you know who Peter is. Um, the, the phrase binding and loosing. I'm trying to work on our time here because we haven't gotten to the other part of this. Uh, the phrase binding and loosing is a common rabbinical phrase for permitting and allowing. Rabbis would talk about that, binding and loosing. I permit, I allow, I forbid. Uh, think, behavior according to the word of God, the teaching of God. So that's a, that's a common rabbinical uh, uh, a turn of phrase that Jesus is using here. Um, most New Testament scholars understand this to be, Catholic and Protestant alike, understand this to be referring to forgiving sin. Um, so the Lord Jesus told Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, be bound in heaven. Catholic apologists often allude to this passage as important evidence for the papacy. Now, no doubt, Christ entrusted Peter with authority in the church. He was an apostle. There's no denying that. Yet he was never made a pope. That was a, that was a, that was a, a concept that was foreign to the early church. To prove the papacy, it must be shown that Jesus delegated supreme power above all the other apostles to Peter alone to rule over the entire church and that his authority is passed on to his alleged successors, the bishops of Rome. Peter's authority was not really superior for the Lord goes on to explain how this authority is exercised, saying, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatever you loose, loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Elsewhere, Jesus gives the same exact authority of binding and loosing to the apostles um, in John 20, 23. He says to them, he, in verse 21, Jesus breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Whatever, anything you forgive will be forgiven. What you do not forgive will not be forgiven. He's speaking to all of his disciples there. In Matthew 16, uh, in, verse, in Matthew 18 uh, as well, same thing. In Matthew 16, Peter is representative of the other apostles and all the church. Because remember, the question is posed to who? Who do you say that I am? Who's the you? The apostles. All of them. His followers at that time. His, his, his cadre, his close followers. He asks them, who do you say that I am? Peter's just the guy who speaks up. Right? He's not afraid to be wrong. And he gets it right. You're the Christ. And Jesus says, you're Peter. You're a rock. You're just a rock. But on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And he's saying to them all, I'll give you all the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I'll give you all the authority to remind people of the forgiveness of their sin. Um, so the, the church continues to exercise this authority through the gospel, proclaiming forgiveness of sins to those who believe in Christ and withholding forgiveness from those who don't. Um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. It's an interesting little study here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2 if you have a Bible. We're, we're going to be done at 8.30. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> because uh, I'm not going to make it by 8. <laughs> oh, you mean go longer? Yeah. Oh, well, you can be just the three of us then. <laughs> Galatians 2 verse 11. Cephas is the name for Peter here in this text. Paul's writing to, the, to Christians living in Galatia. So the Apostle Paul 
writing to people, Christians living in, in the city, telling the story about uh, an encounter he had with Peter, the supposed first pope. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. That is no way to talk to a pope or to the supreme bishop of all the Christians on earth at the time. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. I won't get into the, de- the weeds of the discussion, that, uh, but Peter was sort of stuck in some Jewish traditions and cultures and was acting in a way inappropriate to the gospel. And Paul called him on it and said, he opposed him to his face and said, you're wrong. That's not exactly strong evidence of infallibility or papal succession or someone, the rock on which the church is built. 1 Peter 5, verses uh, 1 through 2. If I can get there. 1 Peter 5. So, this is Peter himself writing, So I exhort the elders among you as, fellow, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Peter, writing these words, I exhort you, elders, the elders among you, as what? A fellow elder. He does not say as the one authority over you, as the supreme pontiff, as your, as your God-appointed leader. He says, I, I'm one of you. So he, he has authority, the apostles had authority, but they all had authority. And that authority is passed on to the leaders of God's church today through the inspiration of his word. Um, one, one other comment here is what we would call revelational insufficiency. If God's divine revelation to us in Scripture needs or requires further infallible interpreting by men, doesn't that, reco- doesn't that imply that it wasn't so in, uh, sufficiently revealed to begin with? If God's revelation to us in his word needs infallible interpreting for us, doesn't it require some, something that's lacking in it? All right, we, we belabored this point, I think. Uh, the issue of salvation and justification. As significant as the issue of authority is, in my opinion, this issue is the most significant. It has the most serious implications. Uh, Justification refers to the way, the theological term for how a person is made right with God. How are we made right with God? um, The Roman Catholic Church teaches that God changes a person and makes him or her just and righteous before God. Protestants understand justification as a moment, God declaring the believer righteous and just on the basis of what Christ did. And there's all the difference in the world between these views. So let me say it again. The Roman Catholic position in brief is that God makes you just over time. The Protestant position is God declares you just because of Christ in a moment. And there's, there's a huge divide over this. Let me, let me just um, put it this, let me just kind of walk you through Basic Roman Catholic teaching experience here. When you sin, the Roman Catholic Church instructs you to go and confess your sins to a priest. How many here have ever made confession to a priest? Nothing wrong with that at all. We should all confess our sins. James tells us that. That priest then will absolve you of your sin and give you works of penance, right? How many of you have ever had uh, absolution pronounced over you and been given penance to perform? Penance usually is in the form of prayers, set prayers, sometimes works of charity, or other duties. Maybe you have to go and make restitution with somebody if it's a particularly heinous relational sin, but the priest will tell you things you must do. Penance. To pay for, even though you're absolved, this is the the distinction, right? Even though you're absolved spiritually, Christ paid for that, you have payment to make temporally. There's temporal payment to be made for your sin. On earth. Temporal meaning on earth. If you don't perform these acts of penance perfectly, and very few ever do, then over the course of your lifetime, you build up, as it were, or accrue a sort of uh, debt, a a load of unpaid for temporally, temporally unpaid for sin. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? And so since we all believe, Catholics and Protestants believe, no sinful person can come into the presence of God when you die with untemporally paid for sin, you cannot come into the presence of God. So you go where? Not hell, because you you're, you're sealed, you're baptized, you're a believer. But you're not ready for heaven, you go to purgatory. Which is an extra biblical doctrine. Doesn't need to be defined, defended by the Bible, because tradition and magisterium sit on equal level with scripture. And, and the, so anyway, you go to purgatory to 
It's kind of a halfway point between heaven and hell. And the purpose is to purge you, that's where the word comes from, of this debt load of sin you have left over to prepare you, to make you sanctified, perfectly holy, ready for heaven. You might be there five years. You might be there 10 years. You might be there five million years. It just depends on what kind of person you are and how good or bad you did. You know, so you go to confession and the, and the priest says, 10 Hail Marys, 10 Our Fathers, and 10 hours of, of, of community service. Okay? Let's say you say 10 Hail Marys, but you slack on the Our Fathers, you say nine of them, and the community service, you think, oh, I'm, I, you know, you, you put an hour. So you, you're missing nine hours, you're missing one prayer, and over the course of your lifetime, you build up, you build up, you build up, and that depends on how long you're going to be in purgatory. Um, once you're purged from your sin, you're fully fit to enter heaven with God. Now, according to this system, the Roman Catholic has what they call a treasury of merit. Let me explain this. So in the same way, um, in the same way that if you don't perform your penance perfectly, there's a debt load of sin left over, if you go above and beyond what's required of you, you get extra credit, right? If you go beyond what's required of you in penance, you, you, you accrue, you go past that, and that goes into like what, what the Roman Catholic Church calls a treasury of merit, a, a spiritual storehouse or bank account, if you will, of righteous deeds, of merit. The Pope has access to that and can grant people a papal indulgence. So in other words, it's, they're not making this up out of the air. When you get a papal indulgence, it's coming out of the treasury of merit. Uh, works of charity, uh, the, the great works, most of the treasury of merit the Roman Catholic Church teaches comes from the work of Christ himself. Then the apostles, then the great saints of the faith, then faithful Catholics throughout the centuries. Go, all that goes into this treasury of merit. That's, they're dispensing indulgences out of this treasury of merit. Um, for, for, to work off, get, to, to buy off some time in purgatory. Um, that, we'll leave that aside for now and move on. So that's... Where were we? Justification, right? Um, R Roman Catholic Catechism, uh, quoting here, justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and the renewal of the interior man. Basically, Roman Catholic theology combines two things. Justification, how you're made right with God, and sanctification, how you grow in holiness. Puts them together and calls that salvation. Evangelical Protestant theology says the Bible separates those two and says justification happens in a moment. God declared, you, you profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he died for your sins and you're declared righteous, just. You're made right with God. Then you enter into a process by which you grow in holiness, becoming like God throughout the course of your life. There's a very important distinction there. Now, there are lots of complicated, nuanced theological issues involved in this debate, but essentially it all boils down to one simple question. Um, Are we saved by grace through faith or are good works and sacraments required for us to be made right with God? That's what it comes down to. Are we made right with God by the grace of Christ through our faith in what he did, period? Or does it need something else? That's what it comes down to. You are either saved by grace through faith alone or you're saved by grace through faith plus sacraments, good works. Both cannot be true. This was the central issue of the Reformation and remains, in my view, the primary and most serious dividing point between what the Roman Catholic Church teaches and what evangelical Protestants believe today. The significance is that the Roman, uh, uh, both agree, the, the tricky part is, both of us agree we're saved by grace, the grace of God alone. A Roman Catholic would not say, well, we can do it on our own. Of course, it's, it's God's grace, it's all God's grace. The Roman Catholic Church will agree that ultimately we're saved by God's grace. will also agree that good works result from our salvation. But the crucial difference is that the Roman Catholic Church denies that grace alone, through faith alone, justifies a person before God. Um, the Council of Trent, some canons here. Whew. If anyone saith that men are justified, either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ, or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and the charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Ghost and the Holy Church and is inherent in them, or even that the grace whereby we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be anathema. Anathema means to be cut off, excommunicated, in other words. Canon uh, number 12. If anyone saith that the justifying faith is nothing else but confidence in the divine mercy which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that his confidence alone is that whereby we are justified, let him be anathema. Clearly, 
a difference, right? Clearly an official rejection of grace alone by faith alone. Sola gratia and sola fide, the reformers said. Uh, can, this is not on the, in the, in the, on the screen, but canon, uh, Tr Council of Trent, Canon number 30. If anyone says that after the reception of grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted and the debt of eternal punishment so blotted out to every repentant sinner that no temporal debt of punishment remains to be discharged, either in this life or in purgatory, before the gates of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema. Think about that. A clear statement. You cannot say, the Roman church says, that when you receive forgiveness of sins, that it's all brought out of the way. What does the, what the psalm, what psalmist tell us? As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. Wash me, David prays, and I'll be whiter than snow. Blot out all my transgressions. The official Roman Catholic teaching is that that does not happen perfectly in this life. You have, to, you have more work to do. Temporal debt of punishment, they call it. Um... The Roman Catholic Church also teaches that the sacrament of baptism forgives your original sin. And you're justified in that moment. But you need further justification. Why? Because we all still sin. So when you're baptized as an infant in the Roman Catholic Church, how many of you were? It's, there's nothing wrong with that. The Catholic Church teaches you were, your original sin, your sinful condition at birth is wiped away, it's forgiven, you're made clean. But going forward, you have work to do because you're going to accrue more debt of sin. So uh, how many of you were taught that the baptism is the seal of eternal life and don't break the seal? Have you ever heard that expression? Don't break your seal, which is the seal of eternal life in your baptism, and sinning breaks the seal? Uh, <clears throat> the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the seven sacraments, I, 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 I see, do we have them down here? I don't know if we have them down here. We don't have them down here. Uh, baptism, communion, uh, confession and penance, right? Uh, those are, I think that's one combined. Confirmation, marriage, uh, holy orders, and extreme unction, or last rites. I think are the seven, if I have those right. You have those right? Any, any, okay. That those sacraments, seven sacraments, belong to the church, and they are avenues, channels of special grace by which the church alone can dispense forgiving grace to you that you can't get any other way. And so... Basically, the Roman Catholic doctrine is, is kind of a spiritual treadmill. You, you get justified, baptized, you enter into this life with God, and you're made right, and then you get on the treadmill. And the treadmill consists of confession, penance, the mass, the sacraments, good works, and, then, and, and so on. And you run that your life hoping for the best. Bottom line is this, salvation justification is either a one-time event that is dependent solely on the grace of God or it is a process that involves the grace of God plus our effort over time and the church's sacraments, right? It's one or the other. Either salvation and being made right with God is a one-time event that depends solely on what Christ did for you or it is a lifelong process in which you play a part and the church plays a part and God's grace plays a part and you work it off over time. I think scripture is abundantly clear that salvation is, ju is justification is an event. God declares you righteous. He, 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 theologians call this imputed righteousness. He gives you the righteousness of Christ because you don't have any on your own and declares you just in his sight. And then sanctification is your life from that point on. But you are saved at that moment and you cannot lose that because Christ did it. In other words, I often would say this to students in my student ministry years ago. Your position with God depends on the strength of his grip on you, not the strength of your grip on him. I'm weak, I might let go in sinfulness, in error. But God is strong and he will not let go. Jesus in John chapter 10 says, I know my sheep, my sheep know me, right? They know my voice. No one is going to snatch them out of my hand. It's a strong grip. The grip of grace. <clears throat> um... Let's talk about the issue of security. There are huge implications involved in this, and there are no more things to swipe, so we can just go. Um, if your salvation is even 1% dependent on you, then how can you be sure of it? How can you know? How do you know if, when you, if and when you've done enough, if there are mortal sins or venial sins un, undealt with? But if it's 100% dependent on Christ, then you can be sure. Hebrews 6, 
Verse 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for our souls, firm and secure. What's that hope? The hope is Christ and what he did on the cross. That's the anchor for our souls. It's secure. It's firm. Um, Romans 6.23, some of you will know this verse by heart, says, for the wages of sin is death. We were studying this just a couple weeks ago in Sola Scriptura, our, our Sunday night Bible study in, in Romans. The wages, the wages what? What's the minimum wage today? Anybody know? I don't even know. Is it, what is it? Anybody know? Huh? 885 is minimum wage? That's what you earn. If you're making minimum wage, you earn 885 an hour. It's owed to you. It's a law. You can't get paid less than that. That's minimum wage, right? Paul says the wages of sin is death. When you sin, you earn something. It's coming to you. We're all getting it, what's coming to us. And it's death. The next line, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He's comparing earning something versus being given something. We earn death by our sin. That's universally true for all humanity. We receive salvation as a gift by grace. You cannot, you can only work for one and you cannot work for the other, Paul's saying. You can only receive it as a gift. If you have to work for your salvation, it's in that instant ceases to be a gift of grace. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now there's uh, lots of huge implications for this. Um, I, 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 and again, this is anecdotal, and I hesitate to use this example because it, it, it may not ex express or uh, describe everybody's experience. But several years ago, a man in our church told me he went to parochial schools, Catholic schools all his life, and he says, I had my fill of nuns by the time I was 12, he said. And uh, he went to a Catholic college even, he went to a Jesuit college. Drifted out of connection with God, with faith, with all of that uh, in his early 20s, and then went off the reservation badly in uh, wild living in his 30s, stumbled his way back to uh, a belief in God and our church through a friend uh, who he worked with when he was in his early 50s. And he said, um, when he came into church, he, his, his, I don't remember his exact words, but this is pretty close to what he said was, he came up to me at, like the second or third time he'd been here, he said, I came the first time and I thought lightning bolt would strike me because I'm in a Baptist church, you know? He said, what do you people do? Do you eat your young? What do Baptists do? I mean, I've been told to stay away from Baptists my whole life, right? So he came the second. I, I didn't get killed or struck down. The earth didn't swallow me up. Came back the second time, and I was nervous that I'm going to be made to feel guilty. Because my whole life, you go to church, and he said, I, I'm, he, calls, he called himself a recovering Catholic. I'm dealing with Catholic guilt. Now, I'm not speaking to everyone's experience. His experience was just this weight, this load of, of guilt over, over sin in his life. And he had lots of reasons to feel that weight. And he says, nothing I ever experienced in, my, in, the, in the church of my upbringing could deal with that, could get rid of it. No penance, no, no, no pattern of confession, no sacrament could ever, spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking, remove that. But the gospel can. And the gospel does not belong to this church or to any one particular church. It belongs to Christ. And it can be proclaimed in a Catholic church as well as a Protestant church. The gospel is what lifted that weight off of his shoulders. Read again here from uh, the Council of Trent, Canon 32. If anyone says that the good works of the one justified are in such manner the gifts of God, and they are not also the good merits of the one justified, or that the justified does not truly merit an increase of God's grace and eternal life, provided one dies in a state of grace, the attainment of this eternal life, as well as an increase of joy, let him be anathema. In other words... <laughs> They're saying, if you don't believe that your good works are, are acquiring for you, are achieving for you, are earning for you your salvation, then you should be anathema. Philippians 2, verses 12 to 13, the Apostle Paul says, um, therefore, in view of God's mercy, he says, we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? G Paul says... Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For God works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Well, which is it? Do we work it out or does God work in us? The Roman Catholic would say, yes and yes. You have a lot of work to do for your salvation. Paul does not say work for your salvation. He does not say work for your salvation. That would contradict what he says many places elsewhere in the New Testament. He says work it out. 
Work out the implications of it in your life. Work out how to live in light of your salvation, not work for it. Clearly, and in, in, in Roman Catholics will appeal to this verse as evidence of, of good works-based salvation. Clearly, he's ta- in verse, if you read chapter 2, he's talking about how we live, how we treat people, how we live in light of God's grace. Because later in chapter 3, in fact, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. This is one of Jenny's favorite passages. I know that because I talked to her about it. Verses 1 through 9, Paul says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To, uh, <clears throat> to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and safe for you. And he, then uh, skipping down to verse... So he, uh, verse 3, for we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, that is in the, my earthly body and the deeds that I perform. In verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to the zeal of persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, some of your Bibles might say legalistic righteousness, he says, blameless, faultless. In other words, you, you'd have to work, look pretty hard to find a guy on earth in human history who lived, who worked as hard, who did it right, better than Paul. He said, in terms of my effort humanly to live according to God's law, I was blameless. I did it all. Nobody can compare to my pedigree, to my lineage, to my education, and to my zeal and effort to be righteous. It's kind of bragging. He's giving me his spiritual resume here before Christ. And then he says, verse 7, But whatever gain I had, I count a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. This is a fun little fact. The word rubbish in Greek is the word skubalon. Uh, Do you know what that word means? It literally refers to human excrement. Do you know there are swear words in the Bible? (laughs) Paul in Greek is saying, I consider all that stuff. So in other words, before I met Jesus, I thought this is how you please God. Work hard. Do right. Be holy. Obey the word word of God. And I, I, I mean, nobody was better than I was at that. I met Jesus, and now that I see grace, that stuff is all scubalone. Right? It's all... Garbage, refuse, human excrement, waste. No English translator can bring themselves to write the word, so they put rubbish, filth, refuse, you know, in here. That's what he's, Paul's trying to be extreme for a reason. He's not saying this stuff isn't valuable. He's saying it doesn't earn me right standing with God. And, and, and compared to what I get from Jesus, it's all worthless. It's all stinking filth. In God's grace, I still want to live this way. I still want to be a holy and righteous man, but I'm not doing it out of uh, uh, fear and obligation and guilt and duty to earn something. I've already got that. Now I get to, right? I'm getting preachy now, I know. This is supposed to be like a lecture. Okay, sorry. (laughs) Um, Okay. So, so basically, we're, we're not, um, the point is, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's talking about work out our salvation, the implications in our lives. In, in, in chapter 3, he's clearly talking about there's a difference between earning something and receiving it by grace. Um, let, me, let me close with, by asking and trying to answer this one, I think, question that's lingering out there. And then I've got some other remarks, but I'll probably break there to give you those that are like, if you're like, I had a college professor that once was teaching about uh, preaching, and he said, um, he says, beware of trying to, trying to have your people drink through a fire hose. I said, what? He says, you know, like a fire hose, it'll knock you right over the pressure of the water. He says, when you give so much information and it goes too long, it's like someone trying to drink through a fire hose. It's like, ah, you can't, it's just overwhelming. I, you can't even ingest anything. Some of you might be feeling like that, like, I'm out of here. Please stop talking. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this question, and then we can stay if you'd like to. Are Roman Catholics Christians? It's a good question, as far as it goes. In our modern age, Christian is a vague and undefined term. Evangelical Christian in the media is used as a pejorative term. If by Christian you mean someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ and what he taught in his gospel, I think it's an impossible question to answer. The same way, 
If you would ask me, are Baptists Christians? I would say, I can't answer that. Are Methodists Christians? Are Episcopals Christians? Are Lutherans Christians? Are Congregationalists Christians? Are non-denominational, people who don't go to church at all, can they be Christians? I can't answer that question for you because you're asking about a group of people. But if you ask me this question, can a Roman Catholic be a genuine Christ follower? I would say yes, of course they can. I would also say, I think sometimes because of the Roman teach, the teaching coming out of Rome, it's harder. The gospel is at best sometimes convoluted and at worst twisted out of shape where it's no gospel at all. And that may offend some of you, but I feel compelled to say it. The more important question is this. Does the message of salvation as taught by the official Roman Catholic doctrine save sinners according to the gospel of Jesus Christ? And I would say no. I would say, I, in fact, last time I did this, four years ago, a woman came up to me and said, I don't believe any of that stuff you said that the Catholics believe. And I said, well, I'm not speaking. For, I, I said to her in a respectful way, well, then you're actually not a very good Catholic because that's what the Catholic Church teaches. Rome's gospel is a spiritual treadmill. Get baptized, get confirmed, get to mass, get to confession, get on the sacramental treadmill and work, it, work for it over the course of your life. And if you do well, you'll have a short time in purgatory, maybe no time at all. If you don't do well, it might be a while unless you acquire some indulgences and get some time off. That's, that's I mean, I am, I'm putting it coarsely and I'm putting it bluntly, but that is the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we have to admit in Protestant churches and Catholic churches, there's a tremendous amount of what we would call nominalism. People that are Christians or, or religious in name only, right? Yeah, I grew up in a Catholic family. I grew up in a, a Baptist family. It's what we do. I'm sort of, I'm a Christian, I guess. I've been a Christian all my life. So we must confine our comments, or my comments, I would say, to what the official teaching of that particular tradition is. According to Scripture, a Christian is someone who is chosen by God before the foundation of the world. That means he knew you, chose you, redeemed and forgiven by the blood of Christ, indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You know and obey the truth of the gospel. You trust in Christ alone for your salvation, and you give all praise and glory to God for his grace. I mean, that's, there's lots of ways to put it. I'm putting it my way as succinctly, scripturally, a Christian Someone who is chosen by God before the foundation of the world, redeemed and forgiven by the blood of Christ, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you know and obey the truth of the gospel, and you trust in Jesus alone for your salvation, and give all praise to God. A Roman Catholic, following the teaching of Rome, fits some of this description, some, some of it, but if, you, if he or she is trusting in the official teaching coming out of the Roman Catholic magisterium and, and, and decrees then I would question if you really know the saving grace of God through Christ. On the other hand, there are plenty of people, I know some of them, who come here every Sunday and who do not know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. This is not a criticism of any one particular religion right now. It's, I, I'm, well, in a way it is, but I'm, it's, it's possible to be sitting in the church all across America of all kinds and miss the grace of Jesus Christ. Quite frankly, a Roman Catholic who believes in the gospel and trusts solely in the grace of Jesus Christ, grace alone by faith alone, is not following the teaching of Rome. Now, I want to end there. Um, I've got prepared remarks on why the Bible is different, what about Mary, communion, prayers to saints, but I would guess some of you are tired of listening. And so I, I'd like to do is end there uh, and uh, give you a little break here. I'll say a little prayer for all of us. And if you'd like to leave and go home, you've got sitters, you're, you're done, feel free. If you'd like to stick around afterwards for another half an hour or so, I've got some remarks. You can ask questions if you like. I'm not saying I could answer them, but I'll try. And then we'll, we'll, we'll leave about a little before nine. So let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace. And I confess to you that I, I must hold all these things lightly. I don't speak as one who has authority. You alone have authority over all of our lives. And we thank you for your word, which we rely on and trust in. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who has given to us what we could never earn for ourselves and what we do not deserve, forgiveness of our sin, the hope of heaven, and life with you now. We thank and we praise you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.